Hi, Mary Beth. I'm Lisa Bonebreak, an Alport Syndrome patient, parent of a patient, and executive director of Alport Syndrome Foundation. I am really excited and grateful to be speaking with you today. Before we get started, I want to be sure that our viewers know a bit about you. Mary Beth Roberts is a general pediatric genetic counselor at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. She specializes in renal genetics and is currently one of two genetic counselors staffing the renal genetics clinic at Cleveland Clinic. She's also the co-founder and co-chair of the Renal Genetics Special Interest Group at the National Society of Genetic Counselors and is involved in various initiatives promoting this new and growing specialty. And Mary Beth has also been working with ASF and our Emerging Leadership Council to help advise on shaping a new digital toolkit for Alport patients. So she's been volunteering with us. We really appreciate that. So thanks for joining me today. And to answer a few of the basic questions that Alport patients seem to be having frequently these days. Are you ready to get started? Absolutely. Happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Okay. So with genetic testing panels for rare kidney diseases like Alport syndrome becoming more accessible, yet being a relatively new tool, increasingly adopted by nephrologists, not all of our medical care providers have extensive knowledge or training to help explain these test results that come to us as patients. When an Alport syndrome patient receives results from genetic testing, it can be challenging and I know myself kind of overwhelming to try to interpret these results ourselves. It's a lot of information to take in and Alport syndrome is rather complex. So that's where experts in genetics like you come in. So meeting with a genetic counselor can be really helpful, I know, to patients like us. That said, my first question is just to begin at the beginning, can you give a brief, brief explanation of what we're talking about when we say genes here in a genetic disease? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so a, a gene essentially is a piece of information or a code that the body uses to develop and grow. It has some kind of function in the body. So much like a string of computer code or like sentences in the pages of a book, um, a, a gene will provide that set of instructions um, for the body to function. Excellent. Okay. So that said, what's the most important piece to understand and focus on from our genetic testing results? Uh, things come up like our genetic type, our mutation, there's a string of numbers associated with our mutation. How do you see that as a genetic counselor? What's the most important things for us to focus on when we get those results? Yeah. So great question. Um, so I think the, the first thing that you're going to look at when you get a genetic uh, result returned is what did they find? So was the result positive, negative, or not quite certain? So the first thing I'd look at is what did the lab report out? Was it a pathogenic variant or a mutation? Was it a variant of uncertain significance? Or was the test negative overall? Uh, the second thing that I would look at is what is the gene impacted and what does that mean for other members of this person's family? What's the mode of inheritance? Because that's really going to um, define, you know, what we do for next steps as far as identifying other family members um, who should consider getting a genetic test. So in that case, is that second piece of information, would that be then the genetic type? Is that the most important thing to focus on then is the genetic type? So the genetic type, you're thinking about missense mutation, uh, nonsense mutation, that type of thing. Is that right? My first thought was X-linked outport syndrome, autosomal ah. recessive, autosomal dominant. Is right. that the first part to focus on? I suppose it depends on what your goals were for genetic testing. So if you are um, a parent, um, you know, if you're expecting, you're planning a family, most often the first question that you have is, how is this going to infect, impact my family? What are, are my kids going to be at risk for this condition? And so that mode of inheritance, um, if, if that's your first thought, then that might be the first thing that you focus on um, versus if you're doing testing and your main um, focus at that point in your life is your own health, your own prognosis, then you may be thinking more about the type of mutation, um, be it a missense, uh, a truncating, and that type of more in the weeds uh, type of thing. 
So can you tell us a little bit for, for Alport patients, what does that mean? A messense, a nonsense mutation? Yeah. We hear that all the time. And, and most yeah. of us have questions about what that means. Of course, yes. Um, I certainly, um, you know, didn't know much about those things myself until I did a lot of years of secondary school, <laughs> secondary education um, to learn all about it. So I definitely would not expect most people to understand what that means right off the bat. Um, I think it might be helpful to talk a little bit more about genes and mutations and define what we mean when we're talking about that um, to then kind of go into um, the weeds about, about those mutation types. Um, so I do have some um, visual aids um, with me here today. These are my genes. <laughs> <laughs> because you know a gene a gene can be a very um, abstract concept and it helps me to think about them when I've actually got something tangible so I, I find that it helps others <laughs> um, so if we're thinking about genes um, genes um, again are those kinds of packets um, of information that our body uses to develop and grow um, genes live on chromosomes which are just larger structures inside cells um, used to store genes. So we get one set, usually we're getting one set from an egg, one set from a sperm. They're coming together to make a whole. Um, when we have a mutation, um, what we call a pathogenic variant, um, what we're looking at is does something along the gene, so the type 4 collagen genes in the case of Alport syndrome, is there something that looks different or abnormal compared to the sequence of the gene that we know is in most people or people who do not have Alport syndrome? So for example, um, when a test comes back positive, we're comparing it, we're comparing a patient's uh, genetic sequence to what we know is, um, is a typical collagen type four gene. And when we're seeing a mutation, we're seeing, you know, something that I'm um, representing with this little star guy. So within that mutation type, we can get something called a, um, a missense variant um, is one type of mutation that we'll see. When we're thinking about genes, we think about DNA, right? The, the, the stuff um, that makes us all unique. DNA is made up of these little building blocks called nucleotides, and those are represented in the genetic code as A's, C's, T's, and G's. So when somebody's doing genetic testing, so some, the scientists at the lab, they're looking along your genes, and they're looking, do, do the A's match up? Do the T's match up? Do the C's and G's match up? When they don't match up, like let's say um, on the um, typical on the typical version of the gene, at this particular position, um, there's supposed to be a T. What we actually see is that there is a G here as an example. So a missense mutation means that there's a substitution or, or a letter out of place in the gene that changes the um, protein this is getting a little bit into the weeds. So I know not everybody has a, has a recent biology class, um, but essentially a change in the code of the gene changes the function of the gene, changes the um, collagen protein that's constructed um, from the gene. And there's a different amino acid or building block of a protein that's now there instead. OK, and that's that's a lot of, you know, complicated information um, that a genetic counselor um, can definitely go through in more detail with you based on your own um, personal results. But that's that's what we're talking about with a missense mutation. Um, another type of mutation or pathogenic variant that we often see um, is called a nonsense or truncating mutation. That type of mutation usually um, causes earlier onset of symptoms 
um, because it means that the type of mutation in the gene um, is such that the collagen itself um, is just not made or, or is made um, in, in such a way that it's not stable and it doesn't, it can't do its job in the body. Um, so, so those are the um, two frequent types of mutations um, that we see. There are other mutation types such as deletions where an entire gene or part of the gene can just be um, deleted out is missing. Um, and there are other um, uh, types of mutations um, that are out there that are probably um, a, a little bit uh, more complicated uh, for the scope of this talk. But certainly it is important to know the type of mutation that you have or for your medical team to know and understand because we know from, uh, from doing research with Alport syndrome patients that that mutation type does correlate into being able to give you a more personalized um, understanding of, of the disease and what that looks like in your family versus the, the next family. Essentially, when we're talking about a nonsense mutation, we're talking about the DNA level or the gene level. So there's within the code of the gene, a nonsense mutation refers to um, an early stop signal. So instead of, it, it's, it's like you don't get to complete the sentence. The, the full stop gets moved up and is put into the middle of the sentence. So if you're reading along, you would stop in the middle of the sentence. So if we think about, we're gonna use this as a, as a protein now because proteins get built step-by-step step, just like genes do. So for a truncating mutation, the, um, the, the protein itself would, would stop being made at a certain point and therefore would be less stable in the body, maybe get broken down quickly, um, or just would be missing those crucial functional parts of the molecule itself to actually go on and do its job. When you get your genetic testing report back, it's really written most of the time for your medical provider. So it's a lot of overwhelming information, sometimes two or three pages worth, and it can be really hard to zone in on what's important for you. Um, but most of the time on the front page or, or even the second page, you'll have a number that will look like a C dot and then three or four numbers and then something like an A and a dash and a T or something like that, right? So what that's referring to, it's, it's kind of like the coordinates of your mutation. So it's, it's like your little needle in the haystack um, or your GPS uh, coordinates for, for where on the map of the gene that mutation is. So the C, the C dot, the C and the C dot is referring to the coding part of the gene. Um, so it, it's just keeping in mind, thinking about um, coding parts of a gene versus non-coding. And again, that's getting out into the weeds a little bit. But the number itself is that coordinate of where, if, we, if this whole thing is a gene, that number, that 966 or whatever that number happens to be, is showing you where along this gene that mutation is happening. And then that A to T or G to C or whatever it is, um, is telling you that um, which, which nucleotide or which uh, DNA letter is typically there and what they found instead. So, so it, are those numbers important for yeah. us to pay attention to Mary Beth? Uh, will it give us some other information ourselves? or for um, a medical provider to help us understand anything more about context of disease progression or inheritance patterns or, or is. So it's, it's more for, um, it, it's more describing, well, A, it's a, it, it's again, it's that GPS signal if other family members are going to get tested. So instead of looking at the whole gene or three genes and wondering where, where's this mutation, if you're the person in the family that has that test result now and has that number, then you have, you have the needle in the haystack and other family members should really just get tested for that one number. So that's the first thing that um, is important about having that number. Um, the second thing is that 
uh, that number essentially is helping the lab to make that prediction about what type of mutation you have. So is this a missense? Is this a truncating? Whatever type of mutation you have, the lab is using those numbers um, to, to figure that out. So I would say it's less important from a patient perspective to have that number memorized and more important for your medical professional um, and for the lab um, to, to figure out what this mutation, what, what is the effect on the gene. Thank you, that makes sense. Uh, what is a variant of unknown significance? It really is one of the most confusing things, I think, as a patient to get back on your genetic testing report. I also think it's important in order to understand what a variant of uncertain significance is, or a VUS, as we say, um, it's important to have a little bit of background about how the scientists at these genetic testing labs um, are, are figuring out your result. So when we're testing genes, um, again, we're, we know what a typical gene looks like. So we have that as a reference. So when we're, when we're sending, when, when you're drawing blood or doing a saliva sample and sending it to the lab, what they're doing is they're reading your DNA, your genetic profile in those genes, and they're comparing it to other people's who we know have um, typical gene, a, a typical version of that gene. Um, so because not all mutations cause disease, that lab has to be really certain when they're calling out a result as positive, that they're doing that with a really high degree of certainty. Um, so when a, a, a variant of uncertain significance is called out, and I'm using this different symbol to represent that, it means that your gene looks different from what was expected or what is typical. Um, the lab will report out um, a VUS if they don't have confidence that this mutation or this difference is actually causing disease. Over time, genetic testing um, interpretation can change. So as we get more research, as more people get tested, our understanding of specific mutations improves. So if somebody has a variant of uncertain significance, that eventually we expect will get clarified. It may take a couple of years, but eventually that our understanding of that mutation will change. And so a variant of uncertain significance will then either be downgraded if we learn that it's really just a normal variant or benign, then it will, it will be reported back out as negative. It may in the future though be reported out as positive if we learn that this type of mutation does in fact change the function or the message um, that the gene provides. So it can be a really frustrating place to be, right? Because you've come so far on this journey, you finally decided to do this genetic test and you're doing it for clarity. You get an unclear result back. It can be a really uncomfortable place to be. Um, so with a, a variant of uncertain significance, you may be asked to do um, additional testing for other family members um, to help to clarify, not as a diagnostic tool because a variant of uncertain significance um, is not is not a diagnostic result. It's not a positive, but it's not quite a negative either. Um, so we don't recommend testing other family members to see if they will or won't have Alport syndrome, but you may be invited to have other family members tested um, to see if we can get more information for the lab so that they can feel more confident in making a call one way or the other. Or if you're trying to have a family and trying to get some more information about, you know, what's the likelihood that my other family members are going to be affected, um, you know, we really, we can't use a variant of uncertain significance to do, um, for example, like a, a, a pre, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Some, pe some people choose to go through IVF um, and, and have a... Um, have an embryo implanted that they know does not have carry the mutation. Um, it, it's not recommended that people do um, prenatal um, genetic testing to see if 
they're carrying an affected pregnancy with a variant of uncertain significance. Um, so, you know, a, a positive result um, will really unlock a lot of doors. It's kind of like you've got the key now, a key to diagnosing other family members, a key to learning more about your own progression of disease, and a key to do those, um, you know, um, family planning options if you want to. Um, but a variant of uncertain significance or a negative result um, really carries um, uh, more limitations. It seems really valuable for patients then because it is so complex to, to consult with a genetic counselor, particularly to understand their results and what it means for their families and how it, how it affects them and to ask their que questions. So um, what, what should patients expect from, from meeting with a genetic counselor? What, what should their expectations be? In general, um, a genetic counselor is going to provide information, resources, and support in a non-judgmental manner. Um, so depending um, you know, on, on what your motivation is and what your goals are, um, a typical session is going to um, involve discussion of your personal and family health history. Um, we're going to go through information about the condition and about the inheritance. Um, more in, in more detail if a family variant is known. Um, and we can have a discussion about the benefits and limitations of genetic testing. Um, so that's, that's what a typical session involves, um, but certainly um, the session can be tailored depending on what your um, main questions and concerns are. And would you recommend that somebody who's genetic test results come back positive for Alport syndrome. Yeah. Would you encourage them to see or seek out a renal genetic counselor? Or um, how do you see that? And I don't even know how common they are. This is so yeah. easy. Um, best case scenario, um, you could see somebody who um, is a little bit more specialized in renal genetics. We're, we're a really new subspecialty um, within genetic counseling. Um, currently, we have um, less than 30 um, people identified as, as practicing clinically. Um, so uh, I, I would say don't, don't necessarily try to hold out to see somebody who specializes in renal. Um, if you visit the um, website for the National Society of Genetic Counselors, um, then you can go to um, findageneticcounselor.nsgc.org and you can search by specialty and nephrology is one of the subspecialties that you can search um, on that website. You know, any, any prenatal um, uh, pediatric or general genetic counselor um, can do a fantastic job. Great. Do most places, when you see a nephrologist and you get your genetic test results, is that the time to ask, will most nephrologists be able to refer you uh, to a genetic counselor? Yeah, I, I would actually say that the, um, the best time to have genetic counseling is when you're considering getting a genetic test. So certainly that won't be an option or, or um, won't be feasible uh, for everybody. But a lot of the, a, a lot of the um, concerns or questions that come up when we talk with people um, are more relevant to the space that they're in before they even go through with getting the test. Um, so things like, um, you know, uh, what, um, what's this going to cost? Um, and, and certainly, you know, genetic testing um, has become so much more accessible. Um, for patients. Um, so, you know, if, if, you're, if your test isn't, uh, you know, close to zero dollars, uh, you may want to ask around. So Mary Beth, are there specific questions do you think that you would recommend people come prepared to ask or what are good questions to, to ask in a genetic counseling session to get the most out of it? Yeah, so certainly if you can, um, if you have information about the health of your family members, especially those who have been impacted by kidney disease, hearing loss, any kind of eye problems, that's information that would be helpful to bring to a genetic counseling session, although certainly not necessary. Um, 
we know that not everybody has um, access to that information for whatever reason. And so it shouldn't be a reason not to come. Um, a lot of people, um, you know, will come to genetic counseling um, wanting to know more about the condition. You know, what is this? How is it going to impact me? What should I expect? Um, is there any cure? Is there any treatment? Um, what, you know, how, how is this going to impact my other family members or my children? Um, a lot of the time when you see a genetic counselor in the pediatric or general adult setting, you're, you have a paired appointment. So you'll be meeting with a medical geneticist as well. Um, frankly, most of those questions about treatment, um, prognosis and things like that are best discussed with your nephrologist. Um, or with a nephrologist who is really well-versed in Alport syndrome. However, a genetic counselor um, can give you general information about prognosis based on the type of mutation that you have, saying that, you know, in general, people with this type of mutation um, have this prognosis um, and can really go into detail about the inheritance, how this runs in the family, um, and can help to coordinate um, testing for other family members, um, providing letters um, to share with other family members to make it easier to have those conversations. You know, let's say people are getting together at Thanksgiving, um, you know, here's, here's a letter um, to, to print out and share with those family members. Um, and, and a genetic counselor can help to work with you to identify um, who else in your family is most at risk and, and could benefit from, from their own genetic counseling session or their own testing. Certainly, certainly it is overwhelming the um, amount of information that you can get once you start going into genetic testing and, and start getting results back. Um, so one of the uh, terms that you may see on a genetic testing report is um, uh, the mode of inheritance. So you'll see um, terms out there like autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or X-linked. And what that is referring to is how this gene or how this mutation is passed through families. So when we're thinking about um, autosomal, um, we are referring to any part of the genetic profile or any gene that is not linked to the sex chromosomes. So chromosomes uh, one through 22. And the main thing to think about with autosomal chromosomes is that there's equal chance for um, males and females to inherit genes on those chromosomes. Um, so, for example, um, COL4A3 and COL4A4 are uh, right next to each other on chromosome 2. And so, if you have a, uh, a dominant form of Alport syndrome, there's a 50% chance um, for that particular gene to go to a child, regardless of biological sex. If we're thinking about a recessive condition, then again, we get two copies of most genes in the body. We get one from sperm, one from egg. So a recessive condition is referring to having a variant or mutation, a pathogenic disease causing mutation on both copies of the gene. So you don't, you don't have a backup copy anymore. And that type of inheritance is usually linked with a much lower chance of recurrence. Um, so that's important to understand and a genetic counselor um, uh, can help with that too. To, I'm, I'm talking about when you have your own children. So, um, so when we say X linked on a report, what that's referring to is the sex chromosomes. So we know that um, most people who are, uh, have typical female characteristics have um, two X chromosomes. Um, most people who have typical male characteristics will have an X and a Y chromosome. So where that becomes important, um, it's important in a couple of ways. One is how that's passed on in families, and two is um, a prognosis for, um, you know, th there's um, a difference in how that disease progresses in families with X-linked versus 
an autosomal recessive or dominant type. Um, so if we're thinking about X-linked and you are and you have two X chromosomes, um, there is a 50% chance of um, passing down the copy of the X chromosome um, with the um, mutation in it and a 50% chance of passing down the copy without the mutation. Um, where that becomes um, really important for, in terms of prognosis for other family members is if that child has inherited a Y chromosome um, uh, from their father or an X chromosome from their father. Um, we know certainly that if, if you inherit an X chromosome, uh, an a, a X-linked um, Alport syndrome, um, and then you have a Y chromosome, you don't have all of the genes on the Y chromosome that you have on the X chromosome. And so if you have, if you have two X chromosomes, you've got a backup copy most of the time of the COL4A5 gene. Um, so that explains why um, people with two X chromosomes don't typically have the severity of symptoms um, with X-linked Alport syndrome that um, somebody with one X chromosome would have. Um, it's certainly not always enough um, to keep the disease from progressing. Um, but we know that progression is, uh, uh, happens later in life and, and sometimes, sometimes not at all, right? If you have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, you don't have that backup copy of that col, uh, Col4A5 gene. And so your, um, your symptoms um, start a lot earlier. That makes sense. That's, I mean, we're very familiar with that in our community because a lot of females were told that they would not progress and their, their disease would be benign or they would be just carriers. Um, but a lot of us X-linked females do have disease progression. So it's a big Absolutely. education point for us around our, for our patient community and, uh, and for medical professionals, nephrologists who were maybe trained many years ago, mm -hmm. um, not understanding this to be the case. Right, so yeah, and I'm sure as you helpful. know, um, uh, very recently a group of people um, who are experts in the field got together and reclassified um, different types of Alport syndrome. So females um, uh, or, or people with two X chromosomes and have X-linked Alport syndrome are no longer carriers. They are affected with Alport syndrome and it's just a matter of, you know, do they, do they progress or not and how quickly? if you're really not in a place where your medical professional is sort of helping guide you, not really super accessible, where would you find a genetic counselor? Is there yeah. a sort of a resource of a typical overall website that you would encourage folks to use? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that website is findageneticcounselor.nsgc.org. Um, so that's through the National Society of Genetic Counselors. Um, you can uh, find a genetic counselor in your area. Um, I think depending on your insurance plan, sometimes you may need a referral um, from a family doctor or, or um, a, another specialist. Um, you may be able to self-refer. Um, I think it just dep depends on your plan. So you should check with your insurance uh, plan first. Um, if you're in a large uh, medical institution, then there may be a genetics um, department within that hospital, and you could um, ask your nephrologist or family doctor to make that referral um, to a genetic counselor um, who is in that same um, facility. Um, but, but certainly that, uh, that website will uh, help you find somebody, hopefully locally, um, th that you could see. That's great. Thank you. I'm going to ask you one more question because I, I think sometimes this does hold some patients back from either getting genetic testing or speaking with a genetic counselor. And that mm -hmm. is concerns about, um, you know, whether there would be any consequences after being identified as having this genetic disease. Uh, is there anything in place yeah. to help protect patients from having any sort of consequence with insurance or yeah. other sort of health consequences or uh, really insurance consequences uh, yeah. related to being identified as a person with a, a rare genetic right. disease. Can you speak to that? Yeah. And I, it, it's unfortunate that, you know, that, that we have to think about that. Um, but it is a reality. And I think it is a really important question. Um, so, so that's one of the 
one of the reasons that I think um, genetic counseling before getting tested is so important because that is one of the things that we cover in a typical session. Um, so um, certainly before the Affordable Care Act, um, a, a lot of people will remember um, that having a pre-existing condition could make it very, very challenging um, to get covered, um, to get reasonable premiums. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that people are wary um, about that. Um, there is a law that was passed in the late 2000s um, called the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, or GINA, um, and they have a helpful website. It's uh, ginahelp.org. Um, so I would encourage people to go and, and read over those um, uh, resources, and they have frequently asked questions and, and examples of, of when GINA comes into play. Um, so what, what that law means is that it is um, illegal to discriminate against you based on having a genetic condition or having a positive family history that puts you at higher risk of having a genetic condition um, by your um, employer and um, for your kind of general um, health insurance coverage plan. Um, so you, your premiums can't be raised because of that diagnosis. Um, and you can't be denied a promotion or be fired um, because you've been identified as, as having a genetic condition. There are some caveats to that. Um, I think if you work for the federal government or the they have their own um, uh, provisions in place, but you're not specifically covered under GINA. And I should add a caveat that I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a legal expert, and so <laughs> um, this is just very general information. Um, but certainly to the size of your employer matters. So if you um, are employed at a place that has 15 or less employees, I don't believe they are um, uh, covered by GINA. Um, where you might run into some tricky spots is if you're doing pre-symptomatic testing. So you have not got a clinical diagnosis of Alport syndrome yet, and you want to know, do I have this? So you know, we're, we're talking more and more these days about pre-symptomatic testing for children um, because of these wonderful advances in, in treatment that have come out. And we know that if you, you know, start, start treating early before um, uh, GFR, before kidney function starts decreasing, um, that seems to be the best, the best time to initiate treatment. So, of course, all of these questions are, are, are important because if you are identified with a genetic test, even if you don't have symptoms, if you're identified at having a high risk of a genetic condition, um, you may find that you're no longer able to purchase life insurance or long-term care or disability insurance. Um, those types of luxury insurances are not covered under the law and therefore can use any, any kind of um, information to deny you a, a policy. Um, so, so that's certainly something to think about before getting tested. Um, you, you can come to genetic counseling and get information and decide not to test or, or that this is not the right time to test. Um, a genetic counselor is never going to force you into doing a genetic test um, or, you know, or, or refuse to see you because you don't want to get one. It really is a conversation. It, it's a launching point for some people just to get all of the facts, all of the information. If at the end of genetic counseling, you decide that genetic, or that genetic testing is not right for you or is not right for you at this time, then we've done our job um, in, in helping you make an informed choice about what's best for you. Um, so, so please don't ever feel like um, a, a genetic counselor is, is um, you know, only going to try to talk you into getting testing if you don't want to. That was really helpful. It's really helpful to understand that there are some protections, some national protections, but there are, uh, there are definitely things to think about and understand. Not, not, not wide ranging, but at least there are protections in place if you work for an employer of a certain size, that sort of thing, to really yeah. understand before we do genetic testing, to really understand uh, what those what those protections are um, and what they don't protect, like long-term insurance and, and long-term care. Uh, that's really helpful to understand. 
Thank you for putting so much of this in context for us today, for helping us break it down and understand from a patient perspective. I feel like patients are really helping drive this, um, these requests for genetic testing because the information can be so valuable and uh, we really need to help understanding and help understanding this new field of renal genetics and just in general, uh, what, what value a genetic counselor can, can bring to us. So thank you so much for spending all this time with me today. And I can't wait to share all of this information with our patient community. Mary Beth, you've been so kind and helpful. Thank you so much for all of your time today. Appreciate it so much. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me.